Hello, everyone. You're listening to Small Business Show. I'm your host, Swire, the promo guy. Uh, today, my guest is Len Hurstein. He has over 30 years experience in business and branding and marketing. Prior to founding his marketing and eventing company, Manage Camp Inc., Len innovate, manage, and group brands for major consumer packaged good marketers, including Coca-Cola, the Campbell Soup Company, and Nabisco. Since 2015, I'm going to ask him more about that. Len has served as a reserve deputy sheriff in Douglas County, Colorado. In his new book, Be Vigilant, Len combined all his experience to provide a detailed roadmap for individual and organization to stop complacency, improve performance, and safeguard the success they have worked so hard to achieve. How are you doing, Len? Good, good. How are you doing, Swire? Um, first question, and I would like to find out more. And uh, would you give us more, a little bit more background about yourself, and why did you become a uh, reserve deputy sheriff in in your uh, area? Yeah, absolutely. So I've got over thirty years of business uh, in uh, consulting, and then brand marketing, and then uh, in entrepreneurism. Uh, with my with my event company manage camp so i started out in consulting and then i went to work uh, for campbell soup and coca-cola and nabisco and in, in consumer packaged goods marketing and then i started manage camp to uh, basically create the brand manage camp conference which we've been doing uh we just had our 19th year last year in 2022 hopefully we'll mark our 20th um most of that live back in 2015 i was looking for a way to give back to the community a way to be uh involved in volunteerism uh, my wife is heavily involved in that and i wasn't uh, i wasn't uh, performing up to snuff in terms in terms of what she was doing so i was looking for something to to do and this opportunity came up to uh to become a reserve sheriff's deputy it wasn't something that i was always looking for i, I didn't grow up wanting to be a cop or anything like that but this opportunity came up and, and it was an opportunity to really um deliver value back to the community i went i ended up going through a uh, full police academy and then uh, a full field training program of 440 hours and then became you know certified as a colorado peace officer and and uh and doing that and so that that's really what it was all about it was me wanting to give back and it wasn't until i got into it that i started to see that there were a lot of things i was learning in this new role that i could apply back to my business life and my personal life and that's that's where be vigilant the book came from okay that's that's nice you know it's always nice to to give back and you find your way uh uh, to to give back to your to your local area. So I want to uh, ask you a question. You know, it's in your bio. So, what in your word, what is complacency, and you know, why is it you know dangerous to you know business individual out there? Yeah, you know, complacency is an interesting word because a lot of us use it. Um, I'm sure after this chat or reading my book, you'll hear it almost every day. You'll hear someone in the news talk about it. You'll hear people talk about it in terms of sports. You'll hear people talk about it in business. It's a word that's thrown out there, but I think it's used incorrectly a lot. And so a lot of people equate complacency with laziness. And, and that's not really what it is. So what I define complacency as is an overconfidence, a self-satisfaction, a self-satisfaction, self-satisfaction, and smugness um, that leads to an unawareness of potential threats or dangers. So and is brought on by success. So the irony is the more successful we are, the more complacent we are uh, vulnerable to becoming. And so that, that, that success leads to an overconfidence that leads to a blindness to potential threats. And that's what complacency is. And it's, it's dangerous because, number one, we don't even know that it's happening, right? And, and, and it makes us vulnerable to all these outside threats and, um, and, and uh, weaknesses that can be, uh, you know, um, taken advantage of by our competition in business or, you know, by other, you know, market forces. So what would you suggest that we do, you know, to catch ourselves, you know, if we are in, in a place of complacency, because like, like you said, when we're successful, when we're on, on the road, right. Yeah. And we don't really see like that, but then sometimes when you look back on a certain time of event that happened uh, for you before, and you know, I should have done this or I should have not take that route. So how would you suggest that we recognize it? Yeah. So the interesting thing about complacency, like you said, is you don't realize that when it's happening, right? You don't know. You don't, you don't find a lot of bootstrapping startups that are maxing out their credit cards and working out of a garage that are complacent, right? That complacency doesn't go along with that. It, it goes along with success and, and being comfortable. And so what the first step to fighting complacency is understanding that it exists. Right. And so 
people think sometimes that the opposite of complacency is paranoia. You know, they get turned off by the fact that it's like, well, what am I supposed to do? Be looking over my shoulder all the time and scared all the time. And that's not the case. So what, in my opinion, the opposite of complacency is not paranoia, it's vigilance. Okay. So vigilance is the awareness of potential threats, whereas paranoia is the fear of them. So one is fear-based, one is awareness-based. And so when you ask me, how do we fight complacency? How do we recognize it? It requires vigilance, right? It requires things that we do every day that help us stay in the aware mindset that fights off and avoids complacency. Do you rely on self-awareness more or, you know, some, some, some of us, you know, I know successful people always have a coach or they work with a consultant uh, no. that, you know, actually tell them what they do. So how would you suggest this, you know, we keep ourselves in check, you know, obviously we wanted to do things a certain way, but then without, you know, finding, uh, you know, where we are, we actually might make the wrong decision. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's, you know, you mentioned my book up front is called Be Vigilant Strategies to Stop Complacency, Improve Performance and Safeguard Success. Uh, it's available right now on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all those places. And you can find out more at, at BeVigilantBook.com. But that book is all about 10 specific things that you can do starting today to help you fight complacency. And a lot of it is putting in processes and putting in systems in place that allow you to fight that complacency, right? So, you know, one of the things I talk about is threat awareness um, and how we can become blindsided to certain threats that are out there. In law enforcement, we have certain things that we do to make sure that we're always trying to keep our threats in front of us, right? That we always have an eye on where the potential threats could come from and also an understanding of what we might do if those threats appear, right? Because one of the things I talk about is the worst time to figure out what you're gonna do in a crisis is when you're in the crisis, right? You wanna figure out what you're gonna do ahead of time because you are going to not rise to the occasion when a crisis comes up, you're gonna to fall to your highest level of training and preparation. And so that's why training and preparation is so important. But what you can do is you can put processes in place that help you make sure that you're keeping an eye out for potential threats, whether they're coming from competitors or government regulation or environmental threats or economic threats or a worldwide pandemic, right? Making sure that you have an eye on where, what those are, where they could come from and what you might do if, when, right? And so what we do is we talk about putting those processes in place. So it's someone's responsibility within your organization or multiple people's responsibilities within your organization to keep an eye out on those threats, identify them early and, and figure out action plans. Okay, so you, you're talking about fighting complacencies with vigilancy. Um, can you give us an example of how, you know, company, um, you know, be able to do that, you know, that help them, you know, to grow better and obviously to, to not step into the trap that they might, uh, that they might have. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, there's 10 chapters devoted each one to a specific strategy to fight complacency, identify complacency and fight complacency. One of the, one of the easiest ones I talk about is this idea of debriefing, right? So one of the things that we do in law enforcement that I picked up on right away is that we debrief a lot. We debrief whether things go right or wrong. And we have specific processes we use to debrief um, that help us keep those effective, right? If you talk to most people in business and you ask them, are you debriefing things right now? The answer will likely be yes. They'll think they are. But the reality is they are more likely to debrief things when they go wrong, right? So we do after action you know, assessments for when stuff goes wrong, when we have failures. And a lot of times that turns into how do we assign blame? Whose fault was it? How do we avoid that in the future, right? What we're less good at doing is debriefing things that are deemed successes, right? And the reality is there's so much to learn and so much that we can do to fight complacency that are hidden in our successes. Because sometimes we have success, but there are things that went wrong along the way and we could have been more successful. Sometimes we have success because our competitor was just worse at something than we were. And we were both bad at it, but they were worse and we won, right? Sometimes we have success purely by accident. Um, and so it's important for us to understand that we need to debrief things regardless of their outcome and look for those places where we can improve and stem some of those things that might be happening. 
say you're, you know, say you're a football team and you're undefeated, right? And you're, and you're, you know, if you're in Denver, you talk about Peyton Manning. Anywhere else, you might talk about Tom Brady. Be a Peyton Manning or Tom Brady because even when they're undefeated, at the end of each game, they go back and they tear it apart, right? They look at what went right, what went wrong, what went right, but went right by accident, what went wrong that we can change and turn into a positive for us, right? These are all things that we have to do even when we're successful. And so in the book, I talk about seven specific things you can do to make sure that your debriefs are effective and efficient and useful. Um, but to me, that's one of the easiest things you can start doing today to, to work into your process. The interesting thing is once you start doing debriefs and once you make people aware of the fact that you will be doing them on a regular basis, regardless of outcome, people will automatically become less complacent because they will pay more attention to what they're doing, knowing that they're going to have to discuss it afterwards. Yeah, I love the example for for de debriefing. Uh, I don't I don't have a law enforcement background, but what I can relate to right away is uh, my my daughter is in the Scout BSA program. So recently we went to a uh, camp out for the first time in 15 months. So. Uh, we have a lot of parents go there because people are dying to go outdoors. So right. what, what happened was uh, we have doctors, we have medical professionals uh, that are very highly educated. So yes. uh, a kid was uh, getting a cramp, so they were able to save them. But when we actually do our cookout, uh, those highly educated professionals never used a propane tank before. Yeah. Uh, but then we also have other parents who was uh, served in the military before who knows how to work all the outdoor gear. So we work as a team. And then at the end, the scoutmaster round all the parents and the kids uh, together. And we kind of do your version of like a de debrief. What have you learned during the camp out? You know, what are yep. some of the skills that uh, we can improve on as a, as a, as a troop? So I think every time, if you do it like that, big or small, maybe you learn something new, maybe you just, uh, practicing the same thing that you've known uh, for a long time. So I think if you talk about it and then if you find out that things that you don't know, uh, then you know what you can work on next time. Just like, you know, your example for the football team, they probably work, uh, watch hours and hours of tape before and after. Right. <laughs> well, and, and that's a, your example is a great one, right? Because it all depends on how you define success, right? If you guys had gone on that camping trip, excuse me, I, I mentioned I have, I do have a cold, sorry. <laughs> if you guys had gone on a camping trip and success was just kids had fun and nobody got really hurt and everybody got home safe, you would have, you would have deemed that a success, right? But you would have missed those kind of mini opportunities to learn, right? So you, you had someone who had a cramp. That's an opportunity to talk about what are things we can do in the future so that a cramp doesn't become something worse, right? What if that cramp had been something different, right? What if, what if you know, what if there had been a, a, a severe case of dehydration, right? What if, what if the, you know, what if that person had fallen and you had some sort of compound fracture? What would you have done, right? To, uh, you know, you're out in the woods. And, and so, you know, it all depends on how you define success. And if you only debrief when you think you have a failure, you're going to miss out on all those other learning opportunities and all those other things that lead to an overconfidence. You know, it happens all the time with boating. We see it in law enforcement with boating. People think they can swim and they become super overconfident in terms of their ability to go out on a large body of water in a boat. Um, and they don't do the simple things like wearing a life jacket or understanding what they're going to do if someone falls overboard and how they're going to get back to them and all those types of things. And so, you know, if you if you might go out on a boat 100 times and come back safe every time and think that you know what you're doing. But until you fall off that one time, you don't really know what you're doing, right? And so all those types of things, those opportunities to look for in business and in life, the opportunities to debrief and find those micro failures so that they don't turn into macro failures. Yeah, like in a, in a business situation, especially in manufacturing, there are so many uh, rules and so many protocol that you need to follow daily. You know, some sometimes, you know, we do it every day. We think it's tedious, but, you know, uh, it's those rules that uh, get us, you know, out of trouble. You know, if you don't follow a certain safety protocol, you know, people are going to get hurt. You know, things are going to get sloppy, and then your result might not be as good as uh, where they were being if you don't follow those simple steps. Absolutely, absolutely. And I talk about that. That's in a whole other chapter in the book. Is about reminders and about things that we can do to turn um, things into habits 
that we should just do every day because they make sense, right? And because if we don't do them, the uh, the the potential outcomes are disastrous. And a lot of that comes from kind of the manufacturing environment, right? Where things go right, but when they go wrong, they go really wrong, right? And that's why you know every vehicle in a manufacturing environment has a beep 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 when it's moving around, right? Because you know it just takes one person to step in front or behind one of those things, and you've got a really bad day. Yeah, let's talk about the book a little more. Um... Why did you decide to write that book? Is it because you see a lot of uh, mistakes that people are making or, you know, and why did you make uh, make the title Be Vigilant? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, like as I was saying up front, one of the things I realized right away was that I thought my police work was going to be completely different than my business life or my personal life. But from day one in the academy, we started learning about this concept of complacency kills. Right. And obviously complacency kills in law enforcement. But with my background and, you know, the lens that I brought to it, I immediately started to see that, you know what, complacency kills brands. It kills businesses. It kills organizations. It kills personal relationships. Right. And so, you know, and that that's where I became kind of obsessed with understanding complacency and understanding what we do to fight it in law enforcement. And, and, and what we do is all, all revolves around vigilance. And that, that's why I wrote the book because I saw these parallels back to business. And I started seeing that people were using the term, you know, complacency wrong, right? They were using it as a throwaway term. A lot of people talked about what, what you know, like don't be complacent, they would throw out there, right? Hey, let's not get complacent. But nobody would ever talk about what that means or what you do about it, right? And the other thing that I kind of recognized was that you know, I've, I've been dealing with authors and, and business books and, and speakers, you know, some of the best minds in marketing and branding for the last 19 years. Um, and there's a lot out there about how to become successful, how to overcome obstacles and become successful. What I didn't find a lot of is what you do once you're there, right? So how do you keep that success? One of the things I talk about is, you know, the end goal, success is not the end goal. Keeping it is, right? It's not just enough to get up to that top and then come back down and then go back up again. You want to get up to that top and you want to stay there, right? And the biggest threat we have to staying there is the complacency that comes with the success we've achieved to get there. Okay. Yeah, that that's really interesting. And, and you know, let me ask you more question about that too, staying up there. So, because all of us want to want to grow our business, want to be better, yeah. but then afterwards we want to be at the next level. So, um, do you have any advice for us for how to stay up there and then, and then, at, at some point, you know, getting to the next level? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, the book is filled with it. I mean, some other things that we can talk about, some problems. So there's obviously problems that come along the way with success, right? We become, you know, we become unaware of the threats that are out there. We become overconfident, right? We might become predictable. I talked about the use of strategic unpredictability in, in you know, staying successful. Once we get to a place, sometimes we have a tendency to say, hey, if it ain't broke, let's not fix it. Right. And that mentality sometimes ends up with us becoming predictable and predictability makes us vulnerable. Right. It makes us vulnerable to competition, makes us vulnerable to threats. We talk about it in law enforcement. We talk about it and we use this term get off the X. Right. If you if you can envision a cartoon where you have a cartoon character standing on an X with a piano hanging over their head, you know, the idea is get off that X. Don't be predictable as to where you are. Right. But we do it all the time in business. We do it in terms of the way we market ourselves. We do it in terms of, you know, not to say that we shouldn't be predictable in terms of the service and the quality of service that we provide to our customers and consumers. But if we don't mix things up, we become a sitting duck. We become a target that's easy to hit. I talk about it, you know, again, not to use too many sports analogies, but this will be my last sports analogy, I promise. Think about it in terms of football. And I don't care where you are in the world. Maybe it's American football. Maybe it's you know, European football, maybe it's Australian rules football. It's the same thing. You've got a person with, with some sort of ball that's running towards some sort of goal, right? And if you're a defender and that person is running straight ahead and you don't have to be a math genius to quickly figure out in your head what angle you need to run and what speed you need to run to intercept them, right? None of us are mathematicians, but we can all do it. We've done it on the playground or whatever level of play we've done. Now, when that person starts moving and juking and spinning, it becomes a lot harder for us to figure out where we need to be, right? This is a concept I talk about in a book. It's a military concept called the OODA loop, O-O-D-A. It stands for observe, orient, decide, 
and act. And we all go through this, right? And the, and the thing is, if we're going through that process and all of a sudden the stimulus changes and we're not prepared for it, we have to go back to the beginning of that process, reobserve, reorient, redecide, and then react, right? And when we're reacting, we're slower than if we were acting, right? And so, you know, the more that we can remain unpredictable, the harder it is for people to peg out where we're going to be and the less uh, easy of a target we become. And so that's another thing we can do to remain successful is make sure that we don't become predictable. And then, and then one other thing I'll throw out there that's, that's super important and really, um, you know, a problem for a lot of companies is understanding what we do with the power that we generate once we become successful, right? And I talk about, there's two chapters I have in the book that are specifically related to this. One is what I call the ATV model, which is accountability plus transparency equals vigilance. And then the other one I talk about is the importance of articulating the why, right? Why are we doing this, right? Why is this happening and understanding our true purpose? And all too often in the business world, when we become successful, the real why, if we're honest with ourselves, becomes because we can, right? Because we can. We can. Why are we treating our vendors that way? Well, because they don't have any other options, because we can. Why are we charging that price to our customers? Well, because we can because they don't have any other options, right? Because we can is never an answer that's going to be good in the long term. And that is one of our one of our biggest threats. And so being able to articulate a true why that goes beyond because we can, right? And talks about a purpose that we have for our customers, for our environment, for our constituents is super important to remaining on top. Yeah, I think you touch on a lot of good point, especially, you know, we are more affected to doing things Always, always the same for the past 15 months. Because an example that I want to give is, you know, uh, at San Francisco at the Fisherman okay. Wharf, there's a clam chowder that uh, restaurant that's been there almost 100 years. People yep. always go there. They don't need to do any marketing. But then uh, I was there two months ago and it went out of business. Mm -hmm. So I guess bef uh, with COVID, there aren't many tourists who go to Fisherman Wharf. And I right. don't think they will go on uh, with the, the way that with the tourists that never thought about, you know, tourists not able to go there and not thinking about uh, business being shut down for however long that it, it needs to be shut down. So, uh, but then at the same time, you know, there are companies that be on their feet and think about how they can do delivery, how they can do online order. So there are actually uh, more uh, you know, shops open now than before. So it's, it's changing. So from, from the perspective that you have the uh, complacency, how would you uh, suggest we respond to the changes that we we have to deal with for the past 15 months? Yeah, so you know what's interesting about the past 15 months is we are much less likely to be complacent when times are hard. So you see a lot of people being really vigilant right now. As soon as things get easier again, that's when the complacencies will settle back in, right? Because we're very, it's a human nature, it's business nature to become become complacent. Um, so there's, there's a couple of things. Number one is to be as prepared as you can for what the potential threats are, right? I, I fell victim to this in my own, uh, you know, we talked about the fact that I was in, in the event business. I am in the event business with my brand managed camp conference, you know, for 19, you know, well, for 17 years, I did it live. And I knew that there were streaming capabilities and people were doing stuff online and all that stuff. We never saw that as a real threat. Everybody in the live event business basically told ourselves, people will always want to get together live. People will always want to meet face to face. That that streaming stuff is never going to take us over, right? We became overconfident, right? And we lost sight of what we even saw the threats coming, but we ignored them, right? And then what happened is we had this worldwide pandemic that forced us prematurely down a path um, that that we may not have been ready for. And so, you know, people might be sitting in the audience saying, well, how do you, you can't prepare for every, you know, potential thing that can happen. Like who would have known, you know, who, who's, who's selling clam chowder and realizes that there might be a pandemic that shuts them down for 15 months, right? The reality is there's two things that you need to do. One is you need to do the best you can to identify where those threats could come from. Um, I'm in the middle of writing something right now about the, uh, the trucking industry, the problem that we're having right now with a shortage of truckers, right? People talk about this as this, this came out of nowhere and this was a COVID problem. This was not a COVID problem. 
This was a problem that was seen coming for a long time. And there's a lot of elements of complacency that made this come to a head. The COVID pandemic pushed it forward way quicker than it would have ever. But all the all the criteria were there for it and people could have seen it coming. So number one is understanding what the threats are and how they can come to fruition. But number two is making sure that you have a process, a nimble and agile process in place to deal with those threats that are unforeseen, right? Part of the problem that we have is we're not good at reacting to threats, right? So there's one thing is that you can prepare for as many threats as you can possibly prepare for. But then you also have to know as an organization or as a family unit, what you're going to do when an unforeseen threat comes about, right? And panic is not a good option, right? Panic is not the answer. So knowing what you're going to do. So when something, when this happens, we're going to automatically, this protocol is going to go into place. This is how we're going to assess this. This is how we're going to get through the observe and orient phase as quickly as possible so we can get to the decision and action phase as soon as possible. That's just as important. Having that agility and flexibility and speed to action built into your organization is just as important as pre-identifying, you know, what you're doing when you pre-identify threats and pre-identify your answers to those threats is you are already in advance doing the observe and orient and decide, right? So when that threat comes up, you can just act. You, you've already decided what you're going to do. You can just act, which makes you quicker than your competition, which makes you get to that. If you're a restaurant, get to that online delivery and figure out all the ways that you're going to be able to still interact and provide an experience to your customers and your diners without them being able to come into your store. Getting there faster than your competition is is the key. Yeah, I think by, you know, always curious in your industry. So you will see things that, you know, people might not have, have seen. And again, it's my last scale, uh, you know, references. And my son is 16. He, he's been scouting for a long time. And my daughter, uh, who is 12, uh, just started scouting, you know, so the way that they prepare, you know, for older uh, kids, when they start a fire, they know exactly what to do. They they know what material to gather in order to start the fire. Uh, but then for kids who are younger, who might not have started a fire uh, in the campsite before, it took them an hour just to do that. So you know, by knowing what needs to be done, maybe the situation will, will have been different. Maybe you have to get uh, different material for Tinder to start the fire, but you have done it before. You have to, you have the training that needs to be done. So uh, the situation changed, but then your principle and your training, you know, is always the same. So, you know, putting it to uh, business. So maybe your uh, instructional menu will be changed. Maybe you are uh, like what we're dealing with right now with our supply chain. So you might not have certain uh, material, but then you can always change. Maybe you get it, get them made in the country or you actually uh, switch to do something else. Like, like you said, with the uh, event industry, maybe you do live, maybe you do a hybrid right now. Maybe right. you just go straight to uh, on, online streaming only. So it could be changed, but then are you prepared to make that change? So I think uh, for uh, the the restaurants out there maybe they're they're not prepared or they don't want to change. So uh, unfortunately, that you know, a lot of them do go out of business because they're not prepared for the, the the change that we have for the past fifteen months. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know your scouting example is a great one. It's about resource, um, you know, like uh, you know artificially limiting resources, right? So you know when you talk about the fire, right? It's easy for someone with a lighter and dry wood to light a fire, right? It's not that hard. Like any any person can probably figure out how to light a fire if they have those tools. The problem is, what if what if you run out of lighter fluid? What if it rains? What if all the wood is damp, right? What if all these things? And that's when you're teaching someone how to build a fire and you're teaching them in, in, in scouts how to build a fire. It's not just about you take fire to something and light it. It's about all these other contingency plans, right? Because if you don't think about those ahead of time, if you're just someone who doesn't know how to light a fire and you just figure, I'm just going to bring my, my lighter out and we're going to be totally fine, and then you get there and it rains, you're not going to rise to the occasion. You're not going to all of a sudden figure out how to light a fire in damp weather, right? You're only going to do that if you've been trained, if you've thought about this thing ahead of time. And those that's, you know, it's a great analogy for business, right? What can you do in your own business as you're thinking about the potential threats to do scenarios where you artificially restrict your resources and find out how would you actually, you know, react to that? What would you do if all of a sudden, you know, you had something happen to your restaurant and you couldn't have people in there, right? Maybe you didn't think about a pandemic, 
But there's another scenario that you could have thought about. Maybe you had a fire. Maybe something happened and you couldn't have anybody in there. How? But your kitchen still worked. How would you? How would you still serve? You know your your diners. How would you still maintain contact with your, with your constituents, right? And so, you know, thinking about all those things that can go wrong is part of that training. I think working remotely, you know, since you touched on that, it's it's been a big part. You know, there are company who been doing remote working, you know, before the pandemic, but there are a uh, company that never thought of, you know, people sitting at home just doing Zoom meeting to conduct that business. So I think for the past 15 months, you know, there are a lot of different changes, uh, people who embrace technology for a while. So they're able to, to go on their, their process, especially, you know, those tech company are able to do that, you know, even sending, uh, don't, they don't need an office anymore. But then for uh, a lot of company who have never done remote working that that being a challenge for a lot of people no it, it absolutely a challenge and the other challenge that that created for everybody is now we've got this thing that everybody's talking about the great resignation right <laughs> for a long time we felt you know a lot of time for a long time employers felt they had the power over employees right especially if you're in a geographic location where there's not a lot of employment options right you might think well who else are they going to work for so i can i can treat them how they want i can pay them how i want i can do all the different things well, now all of a sudden we've got a situation where people aren't willing to accept that anymore. And we have all these remote opportunities where, you know, businesses are opening up. You don't have to live where they work anymore, right? You can live anywhere and do your job. And so the competition that employers have for talent has become so much greater, right? And all of a sudden that table, that balance has turned in a lot of industries where it was so heavily favored in terms of the employer for so long. And when, if you, if you ask them, why, if they were really honest with themselves, getting back to this, articulating the why, if you asked them five years ago why they were doing X, Y, and Z policies with employees or not allowing them to do remote or not this or not that, it's because they could, right? Because the other party didn't have as many options. Well, now those options exist and they're starting to pay the price, right? And so this didn't necessarily come on because of COVID, but COVID, you know, sped it up, right? It accelerated it. I think we would have headed there anyways. But like you said, the, these these dynamics in terms of being able to adapt to them and being able to understand why you're doing what you're doing really separates out those who are going to be successful from those who are going to lag behind. Yeah, and and like you've been saying, you know, there are companies who prepare themselves for that. So they maybe two years ago we we don't have the technology that we have with streaming and video conferencing and people weren't ready for it. But now everyone has their webcam set up, very comfortable with a uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, then, you know, people are jumping on it. So there are a lot of companies benefiting from that, growing, you know, 10, 20 times, you know, for, for, for example. But then there are companies who never want to do that, but then now everyone's shifted. Then you're left alone, you know, in, in yeah. where, where you are. So I think uh, that's, I think, you hit on a very good point. Always be ready. Maybe it's not time yet today, but then when it's ready, then you better be out there and you know capable of doing uh, and shift with the market. If not, you're going to be left behind. Yeah, and one of the things that I think we've we've known for a long time, but I think it's really driven been driven home in this last year and a half, is that the best type of disruption is self disruption. So if you see the changes coming, don't wait for them be the one to get ahead of the curve, right? Self disrupt, put yourself ahead of the curve, ahead of your competition, put yourself in the best position. If you see that coming, don't just wait for it and hope it'll let, take as long as possible so you don't have to do it, right? Because eventually that disruption is going to come, right? And if you're not ready for it, and you know, if you're not, if you're not in charge of the narrative at that point, you're behind, you're behind the game. Great. Hey, Len, uh, if listener and viewer want to get in touch with you and learn more about what you do, what would be the best way? Yeah. So number one is right here on LinkedIn. You can reach out and connect with me right now. I, I would love to uh, hear from people and, and and hear about how this stuff relates to you. Um, the uh, It's just Len Hurstein. You can see my name on the thing there. Um, the other thing is you can just go to lenherstein.com and that's where all the information about me and the book Be Vigilant is. And like I said, Be Vigilant is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Apple Books and all sorts of places where you can buy books. Um, but if, if you just want a link to your favorite one, just go to you know lenherstein.com or bevigilantbook.com. Thank you so much, Len, for coming on the show. I, I'm definitely going to check out your book. Seems like a lot of very useful uh, strategy that you know everyone can use. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Swire. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And uh, 
Yeah. Thanks again. Anytime.